Hi team. Three things today. First, Bertuzzi speaking in general. Then, I'm going to focus a little bit on calls to action. And finally, I want to talk about visual aids. So persuasive speaking. When was the last time a speech changed your life? My guess is never, or at least not directly. Uh, people don't make grand life choices after listening to a 10 minute talk, particularly if they already disagree with the message. Speeches can be a great text when it comes to reinforcing values or directing already existing values into new actions. But when it comes to really changing minds, they tend to fall on deaf ears. Now I've told you that you need to cater your speech making to a specific audience. That can often mean only talking to people about things they already agree with. So what are we trying to do with persuasive speaking? Instead of grand scale change, we aim our speeches at precise, practical action. We sow the seeds of change rather than force it. That is where speech making actually shines. Let me give you an example. Let's say I'm a spokesperson for vegetarianism and I need to give a talk at some company. And I find out that this place employs mostly, um, let's say, Texan conservative men in their 40s. Now, older demographics are less likely to make a life-altering change, particularly when, they, when those go against cultural traditions or well-established habits. I could go on in there and tell them that meat is murder, but that will surely fall on deaf ears. Instead, I reframe my goals. I can't convince them that meat is murder, but I could begin to deconstruct those well-established cultural habits. My call to action here will be to have a meatless Monday at the company's cafeteria. That is not only much more manageable, but also less life-altering. But it could still go wrong if my main reason is that, you know, meat is murder. So here is where I cater my arguments to the audience. And to do that, I will use Monroe's motivating sequence to paint a particular picture. Something like, um, we all know not all cuts of meat are made the same. We've all bitten into a flat, elastic, sad cow steak uh, more often than we've wanted. Now, wouldn't it be fantastic to live in a world of prime cuts, eating well-loved and fed cows only? I'm here to tell you that that is a much closer reality than you think. I have a proposal that can help your company save enough money to buy better cuts of meat every single day. Juicy, loved, rare. And all it takes is one day every week where instead of meat, you all get to try, uh, I don't know, Big Mama's world famous recipe for three bean chili. End scene. Okay, so instead of clashing with people's values, I've aligned myself with a financial argument, and an argument about meat quality that is hard to disagree with. I've snuck in there some language about the caring for animals without making it my main point. But more importantly, I've offered a call to action that reduces meat consumption without criticizing large cultural habits, but at the same time, overriding some of those habits themselves. It's a lot easier to imagine a meatless world where there are meatless days already. Here, I've only offered one argument, but your persuasive speech should not only shape, should not be shaped entirely by Monroe's motivating sequence. Uh, this tool is best used to shape an introduction and not a conclusion. Your persuasive speech will take the form of informative speeches with an intro, a conclusion, and three body paragraphs. Your body paragraphs need to be the evidence that backs up your larger thesis. In my previous example, my body paragraphs could have been one, how the financial strategy of the office cafeteria prioritizes quantity over quality. Two, how meat quality, which includes fair treatment of animals, is more important than quantity when it comes to customer satisfaction. And three, how this three bean chili is not only delicious, but will literally improve the entire week's food. Um, now, this is where your sources come in. In your persuasive speeches, much like in your informative speeches, I need you to have three sources, and one of them has to be academic. We use one for each of your body paragraphs. Okay, now on to a call to action. Your persuasive speech needs to have a strong call to action. This can be your thesis, or it can be related to your thesis, but a lot of thought needs to be put into it. A call to action needs to be doable, but also needs to take some effort so that it can be memorable. Signing a petition is not a good call to action because it's too easy. You can do it with a, with a click and be done. Quitting me together, altogether is too hard. It requires too much effort and can therefore also be brushed off as something that's unrealistic. Attending an upcoming rally, that's a good call to action, but you need to make sure that your audience 
uh, that you're doing all of the legwork for your audience. You need to tell them where the rally is, when it's happening, and what they need to do when they get there. You need to do the audience's legwork so that they can accept your call to action, even when it seems a little bit hard. This allows them to continue their education on what you're preaching and leave a long-lasting impression that can sow the seeds for further persuasion. You don't need to mention your call to action in your introduction, but it's always useful for an audience to know what they're getting into. Um, so I need you to practice those calls to actions, particularly in this week's impromptu speech. But we'll get to that in a little bit. So let's talk about visual aids now. Usually, I ask for visual aids in the final speech, but that would require a video editing software and skills, and that's just not part of a requirement for this course. You can use props in your persuasive speech if you want to, and this week's impromptu will help you practice that. I want you to sell me something. Grab an item in your room and use it creatively during your speech to sell it to me. Practice both your prop skills and your call to action. I need you to do all the legwork so that buying this thing is easy for me and your classmates. How, will, how can you use your prop? Well, to do that, we can look at, at the video examples for this week. David Phillips gives us a, a bunch of principles and specific PowerPoint examples. But from them, you can take that what you need to do with your visual aids is constantly negotiate the attention between your audience and yourself, keeping you at the center and not giving the audience a reason to be distracted by your visual aids. From James Feicht, we learned that there are exceptions and that a visual aid, when used creatively, can help engage an audience and can help deliver a punchline. Use these lessons uh, and have fun with your props. Try something different this week. Uh, and give me a great infomercial in two minutes. So that's pretty much all for me today. Uh, this is the last week of coursework, so make sure you do your freaking posts. You have until the end of the week to make up this week's post or any that you haven't done before. And if you do that, please send me an email so I can check them. If you don't, you will not be grateful for those. Um, later this week, you can expect an email from me um, about your grades, in your storytelling speeches and instructions on how to set up our one-on-one -on -one calls uh, for next week. Um, it might be a good idea to start thinking about your persuasive speech topic. Uh, what's gonna be your call to action? What are you gonna try to persuade your classmates on? Um, probably I'm gonna ask you to give that to me on Sunday so that you already have an idea of what you're doing in your speech by the time uh, we schedule a Zoom meeting. Uh, that's it, cheers.